Hi everyone! Yay! Welcome to Astronomy 101. We didn't do this last week, so we are um, catching back up and it's gonna be really fun. We got some cool stuff to talk about today. Um, lots of requests and it's gonna be lots of love and it's gonna be fun, I promise. We're gonna talk about dwarf planets, um, the history of Pluto and some of those adventures, and um, cosmic collisions. So to kick things off, let's dive right in with what we talked about last week. Last week we talked about asteroids, what they are, um, how many of them are actually in our solar system. There's, you know, a crazy disturbing amount <laughs> of asteroids. Um, and, you know, how we define them, how we have asteroids in the asteroid belt with particularly um, is more rocks and metals because of the condensation temperature of those compared to out in the Kuiper belt where we're talking more along the lines of ices and those sort of things. Um, then we have meteors. So meteors are essentially asteroids that um, burn up in our atmosphere. So they come in contact with the Earth's atmosphere. If they actually make contact with the ground, we call them meteorites because they were right. They made it through and hit the ground. All those little tricks. And um, and then comets. And that was this distinction about the condensation. So the rocks and metals on the inner part of our solar system really condensed out and then um, into rocks and metals. And then further out in the Kuiper belt, that's where you have more hydrogen compounds that froze out such like water. Um, but ammonia and methane and all of those things too. And those are what we call ices. And so when you have kind of more ice rich objects, we refer to those more as comets than we do as asteroids. And that's going to be an important distinction when we talk about the Kuiper belt today. So this week, <laughs> I mean, I can't not, it's just so funny and it's mean, but it's funny, but it's mean, but it's also funny. <laughs> um, I do appreciate that there are a lot of emotions around Pluto. I will say up front, we are here to learn science. <laughs> and unfortunately, ooh, I just realized the chat is not updating in the thing. So let me do that real quick before I get into my lecture <laughs> about this. The, um, all right, that should work. <clears throat> let me see if that does anything. All right, yes, all right, so we are in there now. Um, so the thing with Pluto is that uh, I'm going to go through the whole history, but the long and short of it is that we learn new things. That's how science works. We learn new things and sometimes we have to reclassify stuff. And that's exactly what happened with Pluto. And we now classify it as a dwarf planet, along with some other awesome, interesting objects in our solar system. He is a very good dog and we love Pluto. <laughs> but he's a dwarf planet. So um, we'll go through the history of it. I think it's a really interesting history. And obviously there's a big like sociological aspect to it too, which, which is also fascinating. Um, but I think primarily it's just learning how all of that evolved, um, how our definition has changed over time, and then what the solar system looks like today, which we've been doing throughout all of this. So <clears throat> Pluto was discovered in 1930 um, by a man named Clyde Tombaugh who was really a, uh, a, it's an interesting story. So the Lowell Observatory was named after Percival Lowell, who postulated the existence of a object beyond Neptune in 1905. Now he died in 1914, so he didn't live in long enough to actually see Pluto detected, but they named the observatory after him. And Clyde Tombaugh was like, a farm boy and what they're doing is they're looking at slide images you know they would take pictures of the night sky and then analyze them and a lot of it I mean it's like student research work you know it's just trying to see if positions change over time and so indeed in 1930 they discovered it and it actually announced the discovery on what would have been Percival Lowell's birthday on March 13th I want to say um, but this is the slide that they actually discovered Pluto with. So this is one day to the next day. You see a little dot right there. And then the next day that little dot has moved from where it was, which was over here, to now it's over here. And this is hard research. 
This is one of the first, like, things that you do in an astronomy lab as you start to kind of go up in your astronomy courses is actually, you know, analyze photographs like this. And this is indeed what a lot of obs observing astronomy does. This is how we detect asteroids as well. And um, anything else, any sort of reflective point in the night sky, but just stare at that for a while and then convince yourself that something has changed without the arrows and you'll cry before you find it. Um, now, now there are some detail changes here and that just has to do with the exposure time. So this had a longer exposure time than this did, but it was still enough to actually pick up the dot in each image. But that's why, you know, some of these look a little bit brighter and bigger than they do in this. But the point is the dots are still where they are, um, except for this one, which moved from, I always try to find it again, from right there to right there. And so that's how, how we discovered Pluto. Now, Pluto, they made this discovery in 1930 and it was always a misfit. They were able to kind of, you know, this is, they discovered Pluto because they were looking along the line of the ecliptic and Pluto was in that ecliptic path. Remember the ecliptic is that plane that our solar system lives in. So where we have the sun at the center, but all of our planets are all on the same plane. And if you want to go back to our um, uh, formation of the solar system lecture, we go into the details of why that is. But when this, you know, possible planet was postulated, they were looking in that ecliptic plane, which is how they discovered it. But then further analysis, because they were looking in this region, right down kind of where Neptune's path would be. But then further analysis made people realize like, oh, it's actually, you know, it's moving up. So it's actually tilted and it's in a highly ecliptic orbit. So you can see here, not only do we have this degree tilt that's above the plane of the ecliptic, but it also has this elliptical orbit. So um, the ecliptic, elliptical is where it's like more of an oval shape where it's nodes that it crosses, this only takes 87 years, then this takes 161 years. So it's not a round path either. And as some people might remember, um, it actually crosses inside Neptune's orbit. If you were to sort of flatten this part out, um, this bit actually lies inside Neptune's orbit. And so we call that a trans-Neptunian object. And um, however, that being said, we have these nodes where it actually physically crosses through Neptune's orbit. Um, it's not actually going to collide with Neptune ever because they are in a resonance orbit. I think it's a two to three resonance orbit, I think. Um, so they're never actually going to collide. They meet at the same spot every single time. So there's never going to be a, a disastrous meeting of the minds as it were. Um, so off the bat, we found an object that's out by Neptune. We're calling it a planet, but it's a little bit weird. It's a little bit weird. It looks kind of rocky. It's small. It's got a high amount of ices and, um, and it's got this highly ecliptic orbit. Now, Phrase has the question here, how assured are astronomers that they've exhausted the ecliptic plane for planet X? Um, not, or planet 10, planet X, planet nine, planet 10, whatever. Um, We'll come back to, to discussing that at the end. Um, I had some questions in that in my previous chat. And uh, yeah, we definitely want to discuss this possibility of other planets or objects, whatever they are, massive objects, outside of the Kuiper Belt. Um, we'll talk about that as well. So um, as I said, this has a Pluto has a 248-year orbit that's very elliptical and more inclined against the ecliptic plane. Um, it is far smaller than our terrestrial planets. So even the four terrestrial planets inside in the inner part of our solar system, where the rocky metals condensed out, um, it's smaller than all of those. And it's got a lot of ice composition to it. Um, it's mostly ice as opposed to those rocks and metals, just to do with that condensation temperatures as, as everything condensed out in the formation of the solar system. So it's very ice rich. Um, it's a lot smaller. And then we have this elliptical inclined orbit. So from the get-go, Pluto was always a little bit of an anomaly. And I think even those of us who were raised with Pluto being the ninth planet, it always stood out. Like I remember when I was a kid learning about, you know, you have four inner rocky planets, you have four outer gas giants, 
and then you have Pluto. <laughs> and, and it was just this little quirky anomaly. Um, now the Kuiper belt is now where we've discovered Pluto lives. Now Pluto's kind of on the inside of the Kuiper belt, you know, it's closer to the sun than, than the rest of the objects, but um, we've known of the Kuiper belt objects and we refer to them mostly as comets since the 1950s. Um, up until then, really all of the inner solar system comets that we've detected that have the tails that, you know, we would say, oh, that's a comet, um, were about 20 kilometers. But there's a really important key here with this one, and that is if these icy balls that we're calling comets are passing into the inner solar system, they're going to sublimate due to the solar radiation. So the sun is going to come by, or as the comet comes by the sun, the heat and the radiation is going to cause ice and particles to flake off of it, which is why we get the comet tails. And again, if you want to learn about comets, that was our, our previous um, lecture, which you can find the, the link to below. But that would cause them to shrink. And then we talked a little bit about how these ones that are repeating comets, they, they lose a little bit of their mass, but it stays gravitationally bound. So as they disappear again, they condense back out. But they were always around 20 kilometers, kind of the biggest ones that we had. Um, but then we found sort of Pluto and, and started to find more objects that were smaller than Pluto, but that were out there in that orbit. Um, and it's still really hard. It's really hard to see. So trying, it's like trying to see, and I love this analogy, a thousand kilometer ball of ice at Pluto's distance is like looking for a snowball, like a fist sized snowball that is 600 kilometers away. It's hard to detect these things. Now, the fact that they are icy helps because remember we have the, our, our favorite astronomy word, albedo, which is the brightness. Um, the albedo of icy objects is going to be much higher because it reflects a lot more light because of that ice. And Pluto is very reflective. It's just covered in ice and snow. And so it reflects a lot of light, which made it easier to detect first. As opposed to imagine you have a snowball that's 600 kilometers away that's purely snow and ice and it's white. And then you have another snowball that's like, you know, one of the mean bully snowballs <laughs> that's got dust and rocks and everything in it. That's going to make it less bright and a little less um, easier to see. So this is why it took so long between discovering Pluto, discovering the rest of the Kuiper Belt objects, and then starting to find objects that were about Pluto's size. We didn't really see them until the 1990s. Once we started detecting them, they started coming in pretty rapidly. But I think, you know, discovering these first large objects other than Pluto, that was the 1990s. I mean, certainly that's when I was like learning about the solar system. And I think maybe some other people in the chat, you know, we were learning about the solar system, but astronomers were learning about the solar system at the same time and just starting to discover this thing called the Kuiper belt um, and really starting to learn a little bit more about it. Um, and indeed, they started to find a lot more um, big objects that were out there. And then they discovered Eris, which was discovered in 2005. And it was the first Kuiper Belt object they discovered that was actually larger than Pluto. Rut row. <laughs> and the best thing about Eris is that they named it after the Greek goddess of discontent, otherwise known as strife and arguments. I wonder why. <laughs> Um, but, uh, it, it's a, it's a honker. So it's approximately the same size. It is technically a little bit bigger than Pluto, but you put them side by side. They look about the same size, but Eris is slightly larger, but it's actually 27% larger in mass. So it has more stuff. That means it has a higher density. If its size is about the same, but it's heavier, it's got more mass. That means it's got a higher density, which means it's going to be more made of rocks and metals than Pluto is which makes it a little bit less reflective, a little bit harder to see. So this discovery of Eris, this is the thing that kind of broke everyone's brain and they were like, oh, okay, crap. For the last 10 years, we've been finding object after object that is smaller than Pluto, but not far off. And now we found one that's bigger than Pluto. And they're all in this region that's like the asteroid belt that's past Neptune. Like, what do we do? We're learning new things. 
how, what is a planet? What's a comet? What's an asteroid? Like, how are we defining these? And um, yes, tumor boy, great question. How did we measure the mass? Is it based on the observed movements of things around it? That's exactly what it is. So we can measure the mass based on its orbit around the sun, but it's easier if there's other objects around it that help. So particularly with Pluto, Pluto has basically a little quasi moon system. Now we define it differently because of its classification, but um, that helps us define its mass. So yes, we observe the orbits and the motion and that tells us what the mass is. Thank you for the question. Um, so just seeing its size does not tell you what its mass is. That's, you can't make that assumption because you have to assume a density. You have to assume a composition of it. So you need to see how it interacts with other objects in order to learn its mass. Great question. Um, so Eris came along in 2005 and broke everything and arguments started and it was not pretty. Um, Around 2006, this is when they got together with the International Astronomical Union and tried to come up with a definition to revisit our definitions. And this was a hard thing because it was like we were collectively as a humanity like learning so much about our solar system and these broad definitions that had been accepted by the scientific community now are massively being challenged by actual data that we have. But it contradicts major definitions that we use. And this is sort of a, um, it's an important point to note, a little bit between the difference of astronomy versus astrophysics. Astrophysics is kind of a lot of what we've been doing here. It's talking about like why the solar system is shaped the way it is. What physical processes shape our solar system to look the way it does? Why is there more metals and rocks near the sun and gases further out away from the sun? All of those are very physics based, you know, um, processes. The astronomy side of it is how we classify those things, how you define them, how you find patterns. And so that's really what started to break down with the discovery of Eris and the Kuiper Belt because the fundamental physics weren't any different. Pluto wasn't any different than it had been. We hadn't discovered that it was made of different stuff or we hadn't discovered anything new about it, but we discovered new stuff about its environment and its surrounding and that changed how we had to think about classifying it and what made sense. So if you don't remember this era, then good for you because <laughs> it's a little bit stressful. Um, it got ugly because it was all based on definitions um, and some people have spent their entire professional lives studying Pluto, advocating for missions to go to Pluto, felt like they would lose clout in the scientific community if Pluto was downgraded to another object. I mean, purely, you know, funding in astronomy is very competitive within your field. You're competing for missions and launches and all of these things. And so people were genuinely worried that now if Pluto is just a Kuiper Belt object and not a planet that we'd never visited, then we wouldn't want to visit it anymore. And so people really thought, fought against it and continue to fight against it. Um, I think unfairly because that's how the scientific process works. But when you've spent your entire career and you feel like that's at risk, you can get kind of defensive. <laughs> Um, so these are the objects that have sort of been discovered around the same time. Now this is actually an old picture because we have names for the other labeled ones now. Um, but you can see they were coming at us fast. Um, I, I don't remember the names obviously. Uh, they're on the next slide. But um, if, you know, discovered in 2003, discovered in 2005, and then we have these other objects that are all out in the Kuiper Belt that are all spherical. They're all kind of comparable in size, even close to Pluto. You know, these are technically smaller than Pluto, but not by much. Um, then we have Charon, and now Charon is kind of about the same size, smaller than some of these objects. Um, and then we have Eris and uh, Eris's daughter, Dysnomia. <laughs> um, that's also a round object in the Kuiper Belt. So we're like, crap, how do we how do we start classifying this stuff? Because it goes against kind of what we understood and what we were learning. So they came up with a definition of a dwarf planet. Um, and I think it's a good one. I personally think that, you know, I'm fairly objective. The reason I'm objective about this and the reason, I guess there's, you either like, you know, you say, okay, well, this is what science is. This is how we learn things. Dwarf planet definition makes sense to me. So we accept it. Um, or you're 
violently not going to accept it because Pluto is a planet and always will be a planet. Um, and there are a lot of people like that. Without naming names, <laughs> my little story about this is, so Eris was discovered in 2005. 2006 is when this debate was going on. 2006 was also when I was in the midst of my undergraduate career and starting to go to seminars in the department for the first time. So my first exposure to the academic research world. I, you know, I've just been a student, been learning things. Now it was like, okay, you got to go to seminars. You start doing research. You start looking at those photographic plates, all of those things. Um, and we had a seminar speaker who was very invested in Pluto. And this was maybe the second or third seminar I'd ever attended. And I'm this young little undergraduate and a bunch of the other sort of ambitious undergraduates are all at this seminar sitting in the back because we feel like we don't belong. And this guy gets up there and just starts. He just wanted to fight. He just got up there and he was like, you know, and this BS at the International Astro... How many of you are in the Astro International Astronomical Union? And just started like yelling and pointing out people. And then obviously they started shouting back and it degraded into a 45 minute screaming match between older academic people who were just like, you know, F you, this is ridiculous. And like, yeah, so there's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was a, a Star Trek best captain debate and it was very, it was very um, uncomfortable. Now there are, yeah, feel free to throw your, your arguments one way or the other, but I, but I genuinely feel like this is what we have to do as scientists. We learn new things and we have to reevaluate what our definitions are. And that's what they did in the International Astronomical Union. They said that, okay, so we... If we're going to reclassify objects that we realize Pluto isn't um, isn't really quite what we expect, which it already was an anomaly. Remember this too. This wasn't like it was a happy-go-lucky thing out there that fit. It didn't fit. There were a lot of anomalies to it already. Um, but then we discover all these other objects. So they said, all right, it has to be large enough that it gravitationally collapsed into about a sphere. And they did come up with a definition for it's like it has to have a certain ellipticity. So you could have like a kind of football shape that would still classify, that still qualified because it was round enough. Um, but these potato shaped asteroids, those would not qualify. Um, so it has to be large enough to gravitationally collapse into a sphere, but it can't, but it's not large enough. It's not massive enough to clear out its orbital neighborhood. So all these other planets that we have, have um, they've been big enough that they clear out their gravitational orbit. Oh, blink. Thank you. That's the term. <laughs> um, so these are the objects we have, and these were the two that didn't have those definitions before. So Haumea is a little bit oblate. It's a little bit of that football shape, but it still falls under that spherical enough. It's It's got a level of symmetry to it that we're okay with it. Um, so these were sort of the big, all right, now we have dwarf planets. It's going to be this, 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 and this. Um, another thing to point out is that you could say, okay, well, then what about our moon? Or what about all these other, like, you know, Titan? What about the moons, essentially? Um, and how does Charon fall into that? Because we always said Pluto and Charon, Pluto was a planet and Charon was its moon. And really the issue with that is it has to do where the gravitational balance is. Um, and sorry, before I get into that, I wanted to think uh, buy one, get 16. I, I agree. I think that I think that's important to see that there is a lot of passion behind it, but I think it can be it can be misused to um, create distrust in the public towards science when it's not presented professionally, I guess if that makes sense. And I'll talk about that with the New Horizons thing, because I, I do feel very strongly about this. Um, and you can see Mercury is there for comparison with the sizes with this. Um, but the trick with the moons is that you look at, uh, you find the gravitational equilibrium between the planet or the, you know, now the dwarf planet, but you look at the planet and its moon, where the gravitational equilibrium is, where if you were to put them both on a scale, where would the balance need to be for it to even out? That's our gravitational equilibrium. And for Earth and the moon, if we put them on a scale with the distances and everything, that gravitational equilibrium would be inside of 
Earth's surface. Um, so inside of Earth's surface, it's a little off because you have this tug, but it's small enough that it's within there. So the point is, is that as they're orbiting, it's not doing, you know, this type of motion, which is what Pluto and Charon do. The gravitational equilibrium between the two of them, and there's other, I'll show you a slide with other objects in that system, that gravitational equilibrium sits like, sits outside of the surface, so they orbit the same. They orbit a point in space. One doesn't orbit the other. They orbit a point in space, and that's the difference there. Um, that's a great question, Mamoff. So, are the orbits close enough that it's possible in the next few hundred thousand years that Pluto and Eris could collide or merge and start clearing out the Kuiper Belt? It's not really, unfortunately. I mean, that would be really cool, but as many objects as there are in the Kuiper Belt. Um, and now we've, you know, we can assume based on the big ones that we've seen and the population distribution of these, that there are thousands of objects out there. They're just not massive enough. And if they collided, they would, yes, they would be more massive. Um, but there's a fairly, at this point in the evolution of the solar system, they've reached a bit of an equilibrium such that these larger objects wouldn't necessarily be tugged violently toward each other because their orbits are... 250, 300 years, maybe up to four or 500 years, maybe. Um, and so that seems like a long time for us, but on the scale of the solar system, they've made lots of orbits around the sun already. So like I said, you know, Pluto and Neptune are never going to crash into each other because they're in an equilibrium. Now, I'm not just saying it can't happen, um, but yeah, I think they would have to be much more massive to start clearing out the Kuiper belt. You'd have to be looking at... Um, yeah, much big, you know, Mercury is kind of the smallest one. And they still have a ways to go before they could start to, to get to that point. But it's a great question. Um, it's a really good question. And uh, yeah, I do, I do really appreciate the, the passion that's behind it, for sure. I mean, that's something I try to convey, right? Try to be passionate and excited, and it is fun and it is interesting. Um, but there, it can sometimes be to the detriment of the public who are trying to learn this stuff. Um, so this is an image of Pluto's system. So we have Pluto and Charon, and then this was used a light filter to cover up their reflection so you could see the other objects here. So these are two different images that they've taken. They took this image and then they covered them up so it made it easier to see these objects out here. Um, but they orbit a point about there in space. Um, so even though it looks like they're you know, orbiting Pluto, it's really the gravitational equilibrium is about outside. So they all wobble around a point in space. That's another part of that dwarf planet definition. Um, but let's, let's appreciate Pluto because it is really cool. And it was the first Kuiper Belt object detected long before any other, decades before any other Kuiper Belt objects because it's so reflective, because it's so much closer. Um, and up until 2015, this was the best picture that we had of Pluto. Now, this was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can say, well, that's ridiculous because the Hubble Space Telescope is a really, really good telescope and takes very pretty pictures. And that's a really crappy picture. <laughs> but the key is, is that um, the Hubble Space Telescope is designed for deep field images. So its pixel sizes are going to be about that big. So we can just stare in one direction and then that's filled with galaxy, you know, distant galaxies and galaxy clusters. But then when you point it at something in our own solar system, you're looking at like a couple pixels across that they're, they're then having to smooth the images over. So that's why it's a crappy picture. Um, but this was, this is what we, what we had for a long time. That was the best picture we had of Pluto. You know, the Voyager probes didn't get close enough to get a good picture of it or anything. So Hubble's image was the best one that we had. Um, and then we sent New Horizons out there. <clears throat> and New Horizons was actually launched uh, in 2006. So let's... Oh, what? Oh, yay! Aw! Ah! <laughs> we got a bunch of gift subs sent out. Thank you, Tumor Boy, and welcome to all the new subscribers. <laughs> Familiar faces. Love it. Um, so... This is a, uh, this is an important thing though. This is where the politics got really ugly. So we can all celebrate this for a second. Thank you, Garrick Jazz Hands. <laughs> no, you're all good, Timber Boy. I appreciate it. And it's good. I love it. It's very kind of you. So celebrations abound. 
Well, we all get those through. We don't want to get distracted by Garrick. So we'll pay attention to Garrick and then get back to it. <laughs> um, but thank you very much. I love it. Lots of good feels. Happy Friday feels. Um, so yeah, if you look at the timeline of the New Horizons mission, you may get a sense for why people were as heated about it as they were. Now, I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder, and the New Horizons mission is from the Southwest Research Institute, whose headquarters is in Boulder. So I had that, that seminar was a particularly insightful um, group of people. Oh, visibly. Thank you. Um, and you can see they discover Eris, and that year that they're talking about downgrading Pluto in that year interim, that's when they launched the mission to Pluto. So people were very on edge that their mission was not going to happen, and it was going to be told to go away. So um, you can see why the tension was there. But it went on its mission. It did not make a straight path. It did all sorts of gravitational slingshots and all those fun things. And then passed by Pluto. So we had, let me see, um, went by Saturn in 2008. It went by Jupiter in 2007. Um, did a bunch of flybys. All this fun stuff. Um, so I will say, as we were talking about the science communicators and the passion and the, the, you know, good feelings that we have toward people being passionate about their field. Um, I will say the reason that I hesitate with that, with respect to the passion against, you know, scientific development is because I think it creates a lot of confusion and having worked at a science, I was, so I was a student when all of this happened. And then when New Horizons got to Pluto, I was working as a educator at a science museum. And every single day, this is 10 years later, every single day I was asked if Pluto is a planet or not. And it's because these PIs, the principal investigators, and the people running this mission were getting a lot of press coverage because New Horizons was getting to Pluto. And every time the broadcasters would ask them, so what's the deal with Pluto? Is it, you know, is it a dwarf planet? Is it a planet? You know, what are your thoughts on that? And they were hard and fast going, oh, it's a planet. Just forget everything else. None of it matters. It's all BS. It's Pluto's a planet. And so people are like, well, wait, what? Like that, that doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, I'm hearing one thing here. My kids are learning one thing in their classroom. And so it engendered a lot of confusion in the public. And that's where I'm a little, like, that's where I feel it was a little bit irresponsible because they were using their platform to just confuse the public. <laughs> that's, that's really the issues that I had with that. So that's my, that's, that's kind of the sociological aspect of the Pluto, you know, uh, the Eris discovery, the dwarf planet definition, and then the New Horizons, um, the New Horizons mission. And exactly by one, um, the message should be that science is a process and it doesn't rely on singular facts. And part of being, but part of being a scientist is continuing to have an open mind. I think that's one of the things that, um, I think is the most important thing about becoming a scientist. And one of the things that gets misconstrued with the public is that scientists are never going to say something is a hundred percent true ever because there's always a chance that we don't have it perfectly right. I mean, you take quantum physics and you end up crying in the shower for two years because, because your reality doesn't make sense anymore because we keep learning new things. And so that's why I think then you get this false equivalency because you're going to ask a scientist, okay, well, are you sure? And that's going to be a hard thing to respond to because you're always at the mercy of learning new things and, and possibly, you know, that's why we repeat experiments is this idea of this repeatability. You have to be able to actually detect things, learn things and, and it's it but it's interesting. And I think um I think that's why I like having these discussions. And I appreciate everyone being, I don't know, positive and open minded. I mean, I don't know, you can yell at me. I I'd prefer if you didn't yell at me. <laughs> but um it's just the you know, the years of my exposure to this is sort of how how I've seen the the dialogue change over time. I know domestic Thank you. Um, 
Domestic and I have changed, exchanged uh, discussions about this. So anyway, with that, let's get back to appreciating Pluto. The best Hubble pick we had in 2010, the best picture we had of Pluto is on the left. Then in 2015, New Horizons started to approach Pluto and it started to look like this. And then we got this picture and this is amazing. Um, Lakevbo, I agree, exactly. And it's so hard because I think as a kid, when you learn about the scientific method, it seems so obvious because as a kid, you're so immersed in the scientific method. It's how you interact with the world, right? You think, okay, well, is the red glowing thing hot? Let me touch it and find out, you know? And then you see another red glowing thing and you go, my hypothesis is that's hot. And then you go and touch it. So as a kid, we think, when you learn the scientific method, you're like, obviously, but it doesn't necessarily sink in because then you lose that perspective later in life and you become so sure of your world and your surroundings that it's important to take a step back as an adult and really think about the scientific method again. And not a lot of people are afforded the opportunity to do that, but beautiful picture. Yes, this is a, this is a optical image. This is a true color image. Um, of Pluto, which as some people are pointing out, there's a nice little heart here. But for me, I don't actually, I had this on my previous slide when we talked about Pluto before. I see this as Pluto the dog. There's the ears, there's the eyes, there's the nose. <laughs> so you're welcome. Um, so it actually is a high amount of water ice here, but it's also um, methane, um, frozen nitrogen. There's some components there. Uh, hydrogen compounds are, are the most part of it. Um, so you get some frozen ammonia as well. So it is water ice. Um, it's a good proportion of water ice, but it, um, but it includes some other frozen compounds as well. Carbon dioxide, for example. Um, so you get, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and then here's a great picture too of Pluto. This is not these are composite images, but, and Sharon here, and you can see how much dimmer Sharon is compared to Pluto. Um, it doesn't have as much ice. It's much more reflective. I really like that picture because you can see why if you have these 600 kilometers away from you at this size, I mean, that, it, that, that is about that size. If you were to take that 600 kilometers away, it's hard to detect. And we knew there was a companion before we detected it, but then we knew what to look for based on Pluto's wobble. So... Um, and then this is a really cool video. This is, so this isn't a real time video. This was put together by, um, a series of photos that New Horizons took as it flew over Pluto, but they did a sort of Pluto flyby composite image video that is gorgeous and awesome. And we love it. There's no sound, so... <laughs> That you can see there's a lot more texture, a lot more surface, mountain range almost looking things. But remember, it's small. <laughs> just, just make Star Trek music with your mouth. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, you just have to remember, like, picture the Cerritos flying over and chipping one of its nacelles on the uh, mountain there. <laughs> but it is beautiful. It's really cool. Really good image. And so, yeah, it's a series of images that we have that they put together to demonstrate the surface of Pluto. It's awesome. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I did enough planet scanning today. Um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah. So, a couple of things here. Um, <laughs> the math involved in getting the flyby is indeed mind-boggling. It is like throwing a grain of sand at a pebble on the other side of even just the country. It's crazy and hitting it. It's crazy and that's why one of the most stressful things about these deep solar system missions is the wake up because it's kind of been doing its own thing and you've just been getting pings occasionally from it and then you have to wake it up. Um, so the brown red surface stuff that's still like being studied 
and that it's more so this sort of thing that it, you know trying to figure out is this a deposit on the top of snow like is this you know <laughs> dirty unrefreshed old snow here or is this an area where the snow has not developed where the ice is not developed and we're seeing down into the rockier part of it um and uh i'm gonna look up the answer because i don't want to misspeak here and i don't i knew this answer five years ago but <laughs> um let me see awesome okay so the blue or the sorry the brown red part is made up of its hydrocarbon molecule chains so various hydrocarbon chains you know you get the hc um chains that turn brown when hit by solar radiation so remember at this distance the sun is basically like one of these stars it's incredibly far away but radiation is hitting it and when it does it's kind of like it oxidizes think about it like rusting and that's exactly what we're seeing here. So Charon has that same, those same materials, the same deposits that we see with that. Um, so we're going to transition a little bit in these last, last 10 minutes or so, um, and talk about cosmic collisions. Now, I hope you, I hope you enjoyed our love of Pluto and dwarf planet discussions because it is important and I don't want to, I don't want to minimize it, but I think that it is worth having the conversation in a very respectful way, which I appreciate all of you for doing. <laughs> um, okay, so cosmic collisions. Let's get into some kablooey stuff. Space kablooeys. Um, Comet Shoemaker-Levy was a big space kablooey that we were able to somewhat witness here. So um, Comet Shoemaker-Levy was on a collision course with Jupiter. Now it was coming at it from kind of this weird ecliptic angle. And I'm going to get into Jupiter's gravitational presence with comets and asteroids at the end of this. Um, but this is sort of images that we have of Comet Shoemaker-Levy coming and hitting the southern hemisphere of Jupiter. We have this whole series of impacts because essentially what happened as Comet Shoemaker-Levy was coming in, um, the gravitational tug of Jupiter kind of shredded it. And, um, you know, it's a comet, it's big, it's getting closer to the sun, and it started to break off into chunks. It's getting tugged extremely by Jupiter. It's on a collision course, so it's starting to pull apart. That gravitational shearing, the spaghettification we talk about with black holes, that's essentially what happened to this comet, um, except it was just the gravitational well of Jupiter kind of, you know, it had, it was being pulled up more on one side than on the other, and it just started to tear apart and then punched into the upper atmosphere of um, Jupiter and left scars for, for a decent period of time. Um, we actually have made note that the impact from this deposited a fair amount of water into the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. That's nothing new. Jupiter has water, um, but it tends to be a lot more hydrogen and helium. So remember, Jupiter and Saturn are, and if you don't remember, that's fine, but from our previous lectures, um, Jupiter and Saturn have a high amount of hydrogen and helium. It's very much like a composition of a sun, just way less massive. Um, and then out Uranus and Neptune are blue because they have high amounts of hydrogen compounds, which are water, methane, ammonia, and the like. And so Jupiter and Saturn are very much lacking in water in their atmosphere, purely because, again, of the condensation that happens as you get further or closer away from the sun. And so we noted that when Shoemaker-Levy pummeled into Jupiter, it deposited a bunch of, of water. Basically, it's like a meteor coming in and breaking up in our atmosphere. That's what happened here. And when it broke up, all that ice melted, all that friction um, melted and deposited water there. And then the fun stuff here on Earth. <laughs> so this is a meteor crater in Arizona. Um, this is a pretty decent impact crater. Uh, it happened about 50,000 years ago. So long ago for us, but not long ago on the scale of the Earth. Not long ago at all on the scale of space. But, um, and then this is the Tukunska. Oh, I said that wrong. Basically, air burst meteor. So this is a big one, I think couple kilometers across maybe maybe it was less than that maybe it was a couple of meters anyway um 
it created an airburst. So as it came in and started burning up in the atmosphere, it did get so hot and was coming in so fast that it essentially condenses all the air in front of it. So think of like, you know, a supersonic shockwave or something. And that shockwave hit the ground and just flattened a massive part of Siberia in 1905, I believe. So these are some of the fun impacts that we've had in our own solar system. And then we can't not talk about Jixalub. Uh, this is the dinosaur killing impact that happened. Um, this is, uh, now this is sort of an artist rendition of it. I, I don't think I grabbed any real pictures of it, but you can see, okay, so this is sort of a combination of real imagery plus details on top, but these C notes, you can actually see them really well from space and it's these sinkholes that were created. That's how we kind of saw that there was a crater here and then radar imagery and all of that. We saw this massive crater that hit and um, really the key is, and this is funny because I spent a couple hours this morning planet scanning in Mass Effect 2, finding some iridium. It's kind of the iridium that keyed us in that this was an, an asteroid event that, you know, we noted that there was a mass extinction that 90, what was it, 95% of the planet species, not species, life died. 75% of all species died. Um, that happened 65 million years ago. And using these rock samples, what they discovered, it was actually more this discovery before this discovery that they can look on this line, which was 65 million years ago, and saw high amounts of iridium, much higher than are naturally occurring here on Earth. And so the realization was that it had to be deposited from space and it had to be a lot of it. And so that's when then looking for that crater, realizing that this is the crater that killed the dinosaurs. Um, sorry, dinosaurs. So when we talk about mass extinction events, I'm probably going to dedicate an Astronomy 101 section to do with my good friend Trevor Valley because we have a, uh, he's a paleontologist. We have a death from space talk that we like to give and uh, we give together. <laughs> I talk about all the stuff that can kill us in space. He talks about all the stuff that has killed us in space. And uh, this breaks down, <laughs> this breaks down how big the asteroid has to be and how often they would hit Earth. And, um, yeah, crazy stuff. Trevor's got a great breakdown of like, what if something the size of like a Punto car hit Los Angeles? How, who would feel that way or when? And uh, yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah, why do they hate us so much? So here, that atmospheric explosion, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, okay, so it was like a dozen meters or so. That was, as soon as I said that, it sounded wrong. Uh, the Tunguska crater was this, the, the airburst explosion. Um, if something around the size of like 100 meters to, you know, half a dozen um, hit, that's where you get a good amount of climate change from all the dust that gets brought up and then changes the composition of our atmosphere tsunamis, it's more likely to hit the ocean. Uh, surface area, ocean is way more likely. And then this is where we get sadness. <laughs> and this is about the size of that Chicxulub crater. And it's about every 100 million years. So our odds are pretty good right now that one of these isn't going to hit us because it's hit us within the last 100 million years. So we have another about 35 million years before our odds are going to start stacking up against us. But who knows? Never say never. <laughs> 2020 Act 3. <laughs> um, and then the important question. Um, <laughs> right, look at it. That's awesome. Um, a lot of people ask the question, okay, so what role does Jupiter play? We have that comet Shoemaker-Levy, you know, pummeled into it, got sucked into the gravitational pull of this. Um, what, what does the, you know impact of these larger Jovian planets actually have on our odds of getting hit by an asteroid. And um, it, you know, Jupiter especially, there's kind of a lot of debate that is it a bodyguard? Is it drawing 
this outer solar system stuff towards it and not letting it hit, or as they come through the asteroid belt, they're tugged both toward Jupiter and Earth, so it's protecting us like a bodyguard? Or is stuff getting drawn to it, not hitting, and then getting flung towards us like this? It nudges objects towards the Earth. And um, it, can, it can go either way. So yes, we will get into, um, in fact, I'll just leave the recording on for now. Um, yes, yeah, so when, let me see. Oh, that's good. So Mammoth pointed out uh, the Chelyab Chelyabinsk airburst in 2013 was about half the size of Tunguska. Um, and <laughs> why not two? And yeah, Jupiter is the chaotic neutral alignment of our solar system. That's the best way to phrase it. And then we will move into, uh, so I'll just kind of wrap things up here, but I'll leave on the, the recording for our Planet, uh, planet Nine discussion. Um, so next week we're going to be talking about extrasolar planetary systems. We'll be moving out of our solar system. I'm talking about star systems, uh, different types of stars. We'll get into the HR diagram. And then we're going to talk about the other ways that we've discovered planets around other stars. So we'll be discussing that um, starting next week. Which should be great. So with that, uh, we've had a few people ask in this stream and the previous one today about the Planet Nine. And we probably have just enough time to talk about it. Um, so as we are... <laughs> Yeah, we all have that, sorry, um, is that professor from Futurama. I don't want to live on this planet anymore. Sympathize. Um, so the whole Planet Nine thing, like I said, we only just start, started discovering large Kuiper Belt objects three decades ago, not that long ago. Then we started discovering objects like Eris and objects that are bigger than Pluto, reclassified as dwarf planets, um, only in the last you know, 20 years. Now, um, we're starting to discover a lot more Kuiper Belt objects. And now that New Horizons has actually flown past, taken imagery, but started to, you know, take pictures of other objects in the Kuiper Belt, we've started to map out their orbits. And there are people who specialize in orbital dynamics and the Kuiper Belt who believe that the orbits of the objects in the Kuiper Belt are behaving in a way that it seems like there may be a planet beyond the Kuiper Belt. Um, so we kind of have our Kuiper Belt and then we have the Oort Cloud. Remember the Oort Cloud is the big spherical sphere <laughs> uh, that extends about one light year to about one light year outside of our solar system. Um, that's the full gravitational extent of our sun extends about one light year. And that's where a lot of comets come from that have those highly elliptical, highly inclined orbits. They're coming from the Oort cloud going back out and then coming back in again. And so studying Oort cloud objects as well as studying the Kuiper belt, there are some people who think that, the, that their orbital motion indicates there may be a massive object outside of that that we have not been able to detect. Brings up an interesting point. So this question about, well, could it be a black hole? Now remember, black holes don't suck like vacuums. Black holes are just deep gravitational wells. If our sun stayed the same mass, just turned into a black hole instead, other than the sunlight, we would orbit it just normally. It's a, you know, it's a gravitational well. And so people have gone to the black hole conclusion because we haven't seen this planet out there. But remember, we're talking about outside the Kuiper Belt, and we're talking about an object that does, might not be highly reflective. It might not be snow or ice. It might be a captured object. It might be any number of things. Um, it, the point is, is that it's not reflective, and that makes it very hard to see. So we could have a large rocky planet. We could have a large um, gas giant, like maybe... A, brown dwarf, like a failed star that's out there. Um, and Jupiter is essentially a super small brown dwarf, right? It's Now, Jupiter would have to be 80 times more massive before it even became close to being a star, but it has that same composition. And so there could be an object like that out there. Uh, the issue is, so the thoughts against that have to do with kind of what we've been able to see. Now, it's this idea that... Um, 
they have to, you know, when we talk about solar system formation, you get these condensation temperatures, as which I've mentioned a lot, but it's really talking about the fact that you get rocks and, and metals condense out close to the sun. As that temperature starts to drop, then you get sort of hydrogen clouds and more hydrogen helium start to condense out. And then you get further out and you start to get condensation of hydrogen compounds and that's where you get your ices. Um, so there would be some icy component out there that would make it more reflective and easier to see. And yes, domestic, and that's, that's the next point, is that the way we understand our solar system to have evolved, it doesn't make sense that there would be a large amount of material out there that could be a planet which is why we hadn't necessarily considered anything like that before. But the arguments for it are looking, I think somewhat looking at the, not just the motion of the Kuiper belt, but also thinking logically from the asteroid belt and how Jupiter's gravitational influence is what prevented a planet from forming in that region. They feel like, which is fair. I mean, there's a lot of models that support that, that Jupiter because it was so massive, any thing that tried to clump out and clear out its orbital path in the asteroid belt region got pulled by Jupiter and was never able to condense out. So that's what people are thinking, like the Kuiper belt, maybe there's a massive object there that prevented any planet from forming, you know, as was postulated, I forgot who asked the question, but um, who asked earlier about like, what if the Kuiper Belt objects could coalesce and actually clear out their orbit and be defined as a planet? The question is, well, maybe there's a giant planet out there that's keeping that from happening. Now, Bywan asked how massive is this thing estimated to be? Wide ranging. people, Because the motivations for predicting this thing are, you know, whether you're looking at the orbits of Kuiper Belts, that could be anything from like Earth size up to maybe Saturn size. If you're looking at something that prevented a planet from forming, then you're looking more like Jupiter size. And then people are getting into that black hole idea. And, um, but I don't, I don't think any, I don't think any models would be supported by anything bigger than around Jupiter's size, because we would actually see that tug on Neptune and on the sun. Remember the sun like wobbles because of our planets as they go around there. The sun kind of does this a little bit and it's hard to see and it doesn't have a big effect. On, it doesn't have an effect on us. Um, but if you had a super massive object out there, you would see that effect. Um, so that's sort of the counterpoints to it. So again, like anything, I mean, domestic dark matter, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> Could be proto matter. Um, I mean, yeah, this idea of maybe dark matter, or maybe some, you know, something that you know, we have for that. Oh, uh, Christoph uh, tried to post a link. So let me let you do that. That should let you post a link. I'm hoping it wasn't a spammy link, but I trust you because you've been here a lot. <laughs> um, so, so this is kind of the, the, the big big question about that. So that that's the planet nine thing. Um, I'll hang on for a couple more because I saw Mamoff just asked. The, we'll we'll close up this question. But um, to anyone watching this recording on YouTube, um, thanks for being here. Like and subscribe and do all that stuff. And you can leave any questions in the comments below and check out the description to find us live on Twitch if you ever want to join the conversation there. Mm -hmm.